you are live. So welcome, welcome to the live stream. And uh, thank you probably Celia for starting the recording. <laughs> um, so congratulations, we're about to make that big leap into 2021. And um, well, I, I think we all know what sort of a start 2021 is gonna have for us. Uh, but you know, we finally get to a year where it sounds like we're just counting. Um, but we're almost there, you just got a few more hours to go. Uh, thank you for joining us. But before we get started, we have Here's your story. an announcement. So coming in February is the Alice All Good Teaching Conference. Yay! This event is put on by the PD Committee. It's going to be a virtual event, very much like the Alice All Tech Conference. And as you can see, it's for certificated staff on Friday, February 26th. Um, and we will handle it like Google Meet just the way we did. We have learned a couple of things, a couple of ideas. I think we're gonna be adding some social opportunities for folks um, as well as just all the great sessions. But why are we talking about that all the way now? Well, because as you know, Alice All presents the best of Alice All. We definitely need folks to uh, apply to be presenters. The bit.ly link is there. It's bit.ly slash Alice All Bunch. The A and the B are case sensitive. I'll leave that up there for just a little bit. I think by now you've received two different emails from Mrs. Anso, and you might have those sitting in your inbox and you're like, oh, good teaching conference. That's months away. I don't need to do that. But if you have something that you think you would like to share, and we all know that we all get better when we share with each other, um, please feel free to submit to uh, a session idea. Just like the Alice All Tech Conference, you need a presenter and a moderator, and the presenter and the moderator should co-plan and go hand in hand, so it's helpful if you find your own. However, if you don't, we might be able to, might, no promises, be able to um, connect you up with somebody who can moderate for you. So, um, one last thing as a reminder, remember that January 11th when we come back is a site PD day. Um, so there will be no live stream that Friday. So we come back January 11th while well, you come back January 11th. Most of us are in, at the district office and then EdServe will be back on the 4th. But um, on the 11th, remember your first day back after break is a site PD day. That means there will be no live stream on January 15th. And now, um, so, you know office hours are Wednesdays and Thursdays. You know to email edtech at alisal.org. But just so you know, most of the edtech office will be out uh, starting the 21st until the 4th. Um, you can send that email in there and the soonest you should expect to hear from, back from it is the 4th because just like you, um, we need our break, especially after the year we've had as well. I'm sure you can understand. So, moving right along. The last uh, live stream PD for 2020 is the EdServ Q&A. So first, let's get started by, um, you know, it's it's not the Alice Elf. We don't bring some pretty strong Bitmoji game. Um, that Santa Claus in the corner, believe it or not, is our very own Mr. Jaramillo. Um, and then just wishing you all happy holidays from everyone um, who could be able to join us. Not all the directors could be here today, however, with us today are Mrs. Anso, um, Ms. Fletcher, Mr. Jaramillo, Dr. Palmer, Dr. Ratliff, Dr. Gomez, Dr. Hernandez, and me, I almost forgot me. So um, we just have a couple of questions to start. I'm gonna stop sharing screen and hopefully my colleagues will, um, will show their shining and, and beautiful faces. Thank you very much everyone. Um, before we get started with questions, would anybody like to have any words that they would like to share to the district? I think since Dr. Hernandez is the only one who came even close to a Christmas sweater, uh, I totally blew it. I forgot it completely today. I have one that lights up and everything. I completely forgot. So I think Dr. Hernandez should, should open us up with comments, please. Well, oh, 2020, 2020 has been a very unique year we will always remember 2020 as none of us experienced any of what's happened this year just wanted to thank everyone in alice hall teachers colleagues here 
everyone who's watching uh, how much we appreciate your hard work, your commitment, your resilience, your patience in these uh, unprecedented times. And wish you all an awesome break. Uh, stay safe. Enjoy uh, as much as you can uh, uh, the holidays, however, however way you celebrate. And we will see you next year. See you in 2021. Thank you so much. So would any of our illustrious Ed Services leaders like to, to impart some holiday greetings or words of wisdom for our, uh, how many are we up to? I think we're almost to 175, 75 viewers. So not so bad. Any case, anyone else? Or we can, we only have two questions so far. So if you have a question for any of the directors or Mrs. Anso, the Assistant Superintendent of Education Services, uh, I think I have emailed you every day this week, beginning Wednesday with a link to it. So it's the same link as it always is for the questions. But in the meantime, before we get started, I'd like to give the other directors or Mrs. Anso a chance to make any comments. Now, I, I'm hoping that they're not emailing us during the break. Everybody needs the, their time off, right? We And I'm hoping not to email you because uh, I think the other day I introduced myself to some someone, uh, uh, one of the teachers says, oh, you're the one that sends all the emails. Yep, I am the email lady. So I will not flood your email during the break with uh, um, GTC, but what is it, January 11th? I will send back, as a, I'll send a reminder. We need all your new learning and um, maybe refined learning and, and in the classroom and what you've learned shared because we, as I think we all agree, we are still gonna be doing remote instruction for a while. So hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And um, now we all know that we don't, last year, I think I saw a couple of memes out there, you know, something that you bought at, in, during 2020, right at the beginning of 2020 for the year that was, that you couldn't use, you know, a lot of uh, passes for, uh, theme parks, a lot of uh, uh, vacations. So sorry about that, but um, it is history, right? It is not the, be the best history, but it's something that uh, hopefully in two years we can look back and, and wonder what I'm gonna do with all these masks that I'm buying, right? Thank you, Mrs. Anso. Um, would any of the other directors like to speak? We're Thank all, we're, all teachers, we're good at wait time. <laughs> okay. Three, two, okie doke. So we're gonna launch into the first question, which I believe is for um, Dr. Palmer. However, Mrs. Onso, and, and honestly, like all of you can, can answer. But, so this question is from Kayla Larison from uh, Creekside. The question is what plans are in place for contact tracing staff and or others who turn up uh, positive after having been on campus for an extended period of time? She has a second part. In addition, uh, what are the limits of district liability for a student or staff contracting COVID-19 on campus or at a district function? Well, thank you, Ms. Larison, for your questions. Um, and I, I may ask you to repeat, since there were two parts, uh, Mr. Harris, but sure. I'll start with um, with contact tracing because uh, I think that could be my middle name right now, contact tracing, Christina, contact tracing Palmer, um, because it has been a, a lot of what I've spent my time doing in the last several weeks since um, the responsibility of, of COVID uh, has fallen largely on my on my um, shoulders. It's actually been really cool too, because part of the contact, the most important part of contact tracing is connecting with people, whether they be the people who have concerns about their symptoms, concerns about the possibility of having been exposed either in the workplace here in Al Asal or um, at home and in some other environment outside of work. Um, I'm getting to talk to people that maybe I've I've met in different um, venues when back in the good old days when we got to meet in rooms together. 
the PDD, um, uh, the Professional Development Center rather. Uh, so that being said, contact tracing is, it's not so much plans, although we are um, adjusting as necessary. We are already in the midst of it because we have had some cases um, and some, um, I'm gonna say some thought to be cases that we have had to follow up on. So basically what we do is we're following exactly the same process that the county follows. Um, I've worked in close contact with them to make sure that we were, you know, sort of crossing all our T's and dotting all of our I's. And so what, what happens is when I am made aware of a case or a potential case, then I get in touch with that person. Um, I want to check first and foremost on, on the well-being, the welfare of that person. How are they doing? How are they feeling? Not just physically, although that is, of course, of importance, uh, but also how are they doing with, with the, the thought that they may be testing positive or receiving re, uh, positive results um, or the reality that they have. Um, so is so it's it's a combination of those things. I speak with that person and then I speak with the people that they have been in contact with. I'm going to say on site, but it could be in departments and so on and so forth because it isn't limited to the school sites that I'm responsible for connecting with. So when I do that, I call um, I call those people. I have to you know get their numbers and things. I also talk with the site administrators to find out if there's anybody that possibly was missed, anybody that was possibly, um, and by forgotten, it's because in the motion, the emotions of the moment, it would be, it could be easily done. So I get in touch first with the person um, that either is or may be positive, and then in the event that it applies, I get in contact with anyone that they may have been in close contact with um, over the course of that recent history. I think that pretty much answered that first question. Um, Mr. Harris, you have the question in front of you. Did, was that the first part? Yes, it was. Okay. And then the second part was, a, I want to say liability was in, the, in there. Right. Would you like me to reread it? Uh, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, what are the limits of, of district liability for a student or staff contracting COVID on campus or at a district function? Okay. And, and that's a, a great question. Really, um, you know, if an employee uh, were to get COVID um, on within the parameters of their work, whether it be at a district function or whether it be on site in the course of doing their work, even albeit remotely using our, our technology and things, um, then really the, the outside parameters would have to do, in terms of liability, would have to do with the possibility that they were eligible for workers' compensation. That would be um, the, the next phase of that. In terms of students, quite frankly, while we have put some um, systems in place for the return of our students, as we all know, they are not back yet. And so in terms of, of liability, that would be something that I would say is, is yet to be determined in terms of uh, talking with legal and so on and so forth in the event that that were to happen. But we're trying to practice very safely all of um, our decision making, including the timing of bringing students back. And so um, we're hoping that that will never reach that level. It's all about trust. OK. Um so we have a, a question that just came in from uh, Ms. Cameron at VRB. Um, and I think it's for Dr. H, but it might be for me a little bit as well. Uh, but Dr. H, I'll let you take the first crack at it. Um, what can teachers, students, and parents expect in terms of how district and state testing will be implemented? How will students be held accountable for validity and completion? Okay, so I forwarded, um, and thank you, Ms. Cameron, for the question. I forwarded an email to all teachers letting them know that, or letting, letting you know that we are going to be administering the, um, the required state metrics, the uh, LPAC starting uh, February 1st in reverse order with sixth grade for all English learners. And then in May, we will be administering starting uh, May 3rd uh, SBAC for all students in third through six. At this point, the state has not given us the final procedures that we will use 
for uh, a, a likely remote uh, administration of the assessments. Uh, as soon as I have that information, I will forward it to all and uh, summarize the key points about how it will differ and what the teacher responsibilities will be. In terms of uh, validity, I believe that's the second part of the question. The state okay. is looking at the metrics. They are modifying the number of questions uh, and, uh, and the time dedicated, considering that the way students would take the test uh, in person through multiple seating, seating, seatings, not just one, one time or one seating, uh, is different. So they've modified the number of questions. They're looking at modifying the number of questions. And they're also updating the secure browser, which will allowed, allow teachers to monitor, even remotely, uh, where students are uh, on the test, which is similar to uh, what we discussed during the light speed uh, live stream uh, a few weeks ago, uh, in that uh, that the secure browser itself will have a feature that will allow teachers to track uh, where students are, and in that way uh, provide more security. Uh, and that's all that we have heard about how we can protect the validity uh, through the administration in terms of uh, statistical comparisons or stati statistical validity. As soon as I get that, I'll share it as well. Anything so, else you'd like to add, uh, Josh? Or yeah, so I was gonna, I'm glad that you brought up Lightspeed Classroom. So I am uh, working on a communication to come in January and this council will have to approve it, but we have seen some overzealousness in a small handful of our colleagues uh, trying to restrict and control um, and it, it has almost universally had these unintended consequences that actually block students from accessing services that they are not only allowed but entitled to. There have been cases of teachers using what's called the focus mode to try and lock kids into a certain place or places and then they lock them out of the portal or they lock them out of the Google Meet with their intervention teacher or the after school program. Um, so in terms of Lightspeed Classroom, I first, sort of separate from the assignment or uh, the assessment phase, kind of encourage everyone to, to really slow and pause on who feel like, oh, this is how I'm going to control the, my student's behavior. This is classroom management tool. This is support and redirect. Uh, most of the time, you know, we've also had lots of stories of teachers going, oh, my kids are going into a meet they shouldn't be in, and it turns out to be the intervention teacher or an RSP teacher or the SLP or the after school program. And the teachers forced to sort of reflect and go, oh, I was assuming the worst. And a lot of our kids are doing the right thing most of the time. And that's really a testament to um, the teachers who've set up good classroom culture, even in this digital time, and um, really high expectations. And, and we think the best practice is to support and redirect, not to, um, not to necessarily control. Um, so, what um, what I would say is when you while you can monitor screens during assessment, whether it's state or district or even just your own, I would use that as the opportunity to have the conversation with the child. If you think about when they test in class, if you think the kid is off task, you don't snatch up the laptop and and call them out and and you know change things and then go back. Um, I think what you um, do is you, you ask the kid, hey, is that the right choice? Is, is that a good choice? Um, and, and that's how we redirect. I would, and I suspect that will be here. When Mr., where Dr. Hernandez is talking about the secure browser, once the kid's logged into the secure browser, it's very difficult to go anywhere else that they're supposed to be. So for, for CASP, that should be less, less of a problem. Um, I, uh, we have another question for uh, Dr. Palmer, but um, one of my one of my helpful Santa's elves hid uh, the question because I Josh. skipped around. Now I'm having to unhide and do a lot of scrolling. I'm sorry, um, Josh. I just wanted to add one thing to go ahead. Good, uh, that on, gives my, time. on my response. And thank you for clarifying. The secure browser is actually uh, 
is the way, like you said, the state would control that students do not enter other applications while they're taking an assessment from the California Assessment and of Student Performance and Progress System, CASP, which is what we, where we, through which we administer SBAC in ELA and math. But um, even even if we were to use Lightspeed to monitor, and like uh, Josh said, as a classroom management tool. Remember that uh, for district benchmarks, uh, remember that the critical information is the information that you, in addition to those assessments, is the information you gather day to day through every one of your lessons that confirms that can be validated by an assessment that you administer later. But the most critical information that you get uh, related to progress and learning is that one that happens that you gather every single opportunity you have to interact with them uh, live or through the work they're completing daily. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think what Dr. H is talking about are formative assessments and teacher-driven assessments maybe you've created in your GLT and um, we, we should never underestimate the validity of those. And, and like you were saying, what we do in district benchmarks and the, and the state test should affirm are already good teaching practices. Those should not be the basis of our teaching practices. Those are summatives. Those are, they, they should not inform our teaching. Okay, so we do have another question from Ms. Larison at Creekside. I think this one is again for Dr. Palmer and possibly for Ms. Anso, um, because I know Ms. Anso has been at the head of the, the small group planning along with, the, uh, I almost promoted you, Mr. Jaramillo, the doctor, uh, to Mr. and Mr. Jaramillo as well. Um, so, uh, this again is two parts. So uh, I'll, I'll read the whole thing in its entirety and then if you need me to repeat any part and, and it begins with a premise that might need to be uh, corrected. Um, so the district has stated that in-person instruction would be Tuesday and Thursday. Is it possible to make it back-to-back -back days as the cohorts are the same on both days, eliminating the need to clean over the day students are not present. It, I will, this is, I'm gonna read it as written because I think there's a word missing. I would it be, I would it to be considered, I think it's, I would like it to be considered to make it Tuesday and Wednesday, eliminating the need for switching between remote instruction and in-person instruction multiple times per week. So sorry, I got, I got, let, how about I read it again? Cause I got lost in the, in the missing word. Um, the district has stated that in-person instruction would be Tuesday and Thursday. Is it possible to make the days back to back as the cohorts are the same on both days, eliminating the need to clean overnight on the days between students when they're not present? I would like it, I think is what she meant. I would like it to be considered to make it Tuesday and Wednesday, eliminating the need for switching between remote and in-person instruction multiple times per week. So I can, so, I can start yeah, and then anybody wants to The first of, part of Ms. Anso. Yeah. So um, the district has not stated the exact dates. All, uh, all we have said, and it's in the plan, it's written and it was a task force that actually um, supported in, in the writing. Then the task force included administrators, certificated teachers, classified members, um, gen ed and uh, special ed. So what we put in the plan was um, cohorts, small group instruction would happen two days out of the week in person and three days remotely. Uh, so there was a, only the two days that was mentioned in person, but we never specified the date. So I don't know if that's coming maybe directly from the site as we have given sites some autonomy on to decide what would work best for them. Right, I, I was gonna say, I don't know that the district had um, ever delineated the days of the week. I would also not presume to speak for Mr. Onso, but I think once any in-person, any time people are coming into rooms right now, maintenance is, is obligated to clean the room. So it really doesn't, it's not like the room would not be cleaned even if the days were back to back. So, so it, it's not really eliminating anything. No. Um, additionally, if it were on a Wednesday, you know, that's, um, that's a GLT day. That's a, 
so the, the schedule would would stay altered because that part of the contract's not changed. That's that's the shortened day for for teacher collab. Um, there you go. I think um, I think that more or less answers that question. Yeah. I don't know why I thought that was you, Dr. Palmer. I don't know either, but I am going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> an opportunity to talk. Um, sorry, but just quickly, I, I want to confirm that indeed the um, the custodians are diligently doing the disinfecting um, at in each of the of the rooms, whether it is a teacher in there um, leading instruction remotely with just the teacher in there, and they're going to return the next day, or at the point that the students return, they're doing that all the time, um, and and trying to be very vigilant about it because it is so important that uh, it is such an important part rather of, of the protocols that we need to follow, like washing our own hands. We need to wash our surfaces and things. And so they've been great about that. So the next question is most definitely for me. Um, Mr. Rodriguez at Steinbeck has said that he's noticed students using Lightspeed Classroom um, I like that we're all using Lightspeed and leaving the word classroom for Google. But uh, using Lightspeed Classroom, uh, noticed students in Meet uh, that they're, and they log into the class Meet later, not at all. Is that being restricted? Is that being looked at as far as restricting? I think what he means is the first part, students are in the Meet as they log into, into class Meet late or not at all. Um, so now that I reread it, I'm, I'm less sure that I understood the question, but in terms of students that are in meets that don't have an adult, um, yes, when we find those, we restrict those. Um, there's no full way to permanently deactivate it. However, every time we have tracked down one of those meets, every time it was created by an adult in the district. Students cannot, do not have the technical ability. Sometimes it's a classroom teacher, sometimes it's after school teacher, sometimes intervention, sometimes a counselor. Um, I feel like Dr. Seuss right now. Um, sometimes it's a goat on a boat. Uh, but the, so as it has been stated multiple times in multiple places, uh, teachers need to make sure to reset, to always use the Google Classroom link because it is the most secure and to regularly reset that link um, because it should make it not useful to, to students any farther. So I'm gonna reread this one more time and maybe somebody can help me because clearly reading is not my strong suit today. Um, in Lightspeed, I have noticed students are in a meet and they log into class meet late or not at all. Is that being looked at as far as restricting? Restricting them being late or restricting them not coming in at all? Mr. Rodriguez, if you could resub the question and maybe clarify, that would be great. Hopefully, I mean, Ms. Griffith, also from Steinbeck, um, but is not on the same question. <laughs> so, Uh, this actually might be for Mr. Anso, who's not on the call, but um, the question is, what do they spray in the air after we leave the classroom? My papers that are out curl up quite dramatically from the spray, just wondering what it is. Um, I don't know that any of us could, could speak to it. I do know that everything that we use in the, in the classroom have to be tested to be non-toxic, hypoallergenic. That's why we tend not to use brand name sprays because they are, and, and I don't think we are allowed to use anything scented. Um, because it can trigger asthma, it can trigger other respiratory sensitivities. Um, uh, so, so there you are. Oh, Mr. Alvarez, a meet that he did not create. So again, Mr. Mr. Alvarez. So it could be a meet from a counselor, an intervention teacher after school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are almost always going to. Um, uh, they, they almost always come from an adult who maybe isn't using anymore and, and kind of uh, lost track of it. Um, Miss Root, I don't know what you mean by Google extensions. So Miss Root is saying, is RSP going to get Lightspeed or Google extensions? Lightspeed is based on Google Classroom. So as far as I know, it has already been added to your portals. Maybe Mr. Jaramillo could, could respond to that, but um, so, Everyone should have it. it. The Lightspeed tile should be in your portal. You will 
only be able to, it's connected through Google Classroom. Again, if we go back two weeks to the live, the live stream on Lightspeed Classroom, um, it doesn't matter if you use the Google Classroom, it matters what kids you have in a Google Classroom. And as far as I know, um, it was supposed to have been added to your portal. It's just a tile in your portal. There's, there's not really anything necessarily to get. Um, I know I don't use mine. I tend to log directly into Google. So, um, but I would, uh, if, if it's not there, I would definitely put a help ticket in. Um, I'm not sure what Google extensions you mean. Any extensions that we push from the district get automatically pushed to everyone, including clerical everyone. Um, in terms of things like breakout rooms for Google Meet, yes, I am happy to be able to announce that we were actually able, once we used up our first batch of licenses, we were able to acquire some more and uh, RSP will be getting the extended Google Meet features along with a couple of other groups that I'll be working with some of the directors and the TOSIS to allocate to make sure um, that everybody who can get them, uh, who doesn't already have them and make sure we don't assign licenses twice. These licenses have to be assigned individually. They're not a site license, they're not broadly applied. And we were only allowed to buy a certain amount based on a certain staff number that I don't know where they got it. But until we use those up, we were not permitted to buy more but we have acquired more. So that was a lot of Mr. Harris talking for a bit. That almost never happens on these. Uh, Mr. Jaramillo, is there anything, just because Ms. Rude asked a, a question and she's in your division, your department? Can, can you uh, She was asking about RSP teachers getting light speed, um, but the, the classroom management, but that should have, as far as I know, gone to everyone. As long as they're using Google Classroom, they'll they'll have access. But remember, it's based on Google Classroom. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming the RSP teachers have kids set up in Google Classrooms, but I, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. Again, Ms. Rood and any of the other RSP teachers that might be watching, check your portal. If it's not there, go ahead and put in an IT ticket. Yeah. Um, but go ahead, Mr. Hardemiel. And that would be my understanding as well, being that they are teachers I mean, it, it would be something that would be assigned to them. But again, if it's not, like you said, I mean, we can follow up with uh, with uh, IT and see what we can do. Right, but but just as a clarifier, I mean, I, I know some of the RSP teachers and they do use Google Classroom. If you don't have one set up, then Lightspeed has nothing to connect to to figure out what teachers you need to, what, not what teachers, what students you need to look at. Um, so again, you, you would just have to set it up. You wouldn't necessarily have to use it on a regular basis, but that's how, that's how Lightspeed figures out who you need to look at. Yeah, and you're, you're right. Uh, we do have some teachers that use Google Classroom mm -hmm. and others that use um, Seesaw. Uh -huh. So what you're so, saying, if they use Seesaw, they wouldn't be able to use that feature. Right, if you, if you only use Seesaw. So my suggestion, and again, Ms. Root, I'm making assumptions here, and if this doesn't apply to you, I'm sorry. Um, but it, it's not like some of our other systems that talk to PowerSchool, it, it looks at our Google Classrooms. So if you don't have one, set it up with the kids that you need. In there, they have to accept the invitation so that they're actually fully enrolled in your Google Classroom, and then you never have to use it again if you're just exclusively using Seesaw. It's just that's how it sets up, and it'll take 24 to 36 hours for it to catch up. Okie doke. So I believe we are at the end of our questions. Can I make an uh, just an announcement, Josh? Or not an announcement? Only if you turn your camera on. <laughs> Sounds good, here we go. I don't have my Christmas hat on, that's why I didn't have it on. But uh, uh, it was. Uh, we've been getting here in our department in EdTech. I know that some of you are so excited you've gotten your new IMAX, yay. Um, I know that some of you are kind of, uh, some of the settings may not be on there correctly, so um, they're not set up correctly, or you're struggling into, into some issues. Please, um, you know, send those, create a help desk ticket as soon as possible to IT. We have been sharing the emails that have been coming to our department to IT, but probably the fastest way to get, uh, to get you know, that fix is to go directly to them. So if you can do that, uh, please do that. And, uh, you know, we have sent those that you've sent to us already to them. So thank you very much. You know, and following up on that, George, if, if you are, um, if your principal has called you and said, hey, your computer's ready, please go down and get it right away. Each one has to be set up per teacher. They can't just 
send 30 of them to the school site and hand them out to whoever comes. They have to be set up for an, an actual specific person. And so um, teachers not picking theirs up or, or, or leaving it for a few days, that's that's creating bottlenecks. So just be be kind and thoughtful to your to your colleagues and and uh, make sure that you let your principal know when you're going to come down and get it. Um, if you're not able to get it today, um, uh, then please make sure your principals know so that they can store it in a secure place. If, if and and also you can find out uh, what days your principals. Some of the principals are going to be working next week, so you can find out uh, what days those are. Um, That's but, yeah, I mean. I'm sorry, go ahead, George. I'm on the help desk. Uh, IT has said if you can also take a screenshot or a screen capture and it can, can, uh, attach that to your help desk ticket, that would be really helpful to them. Thank you. So while we're on this topic, Ms. Griffith from, from Steinbeck, why is it better, the new computer? I think she means why is the new computer better? Um, oh, it's got, um, the screen is almost twice as big as your laptop. It's got three or four times the memory. Its processor is like, four times as powerful and newer. Um, it's it's bigger, better, faster, more is is the best way to say it. Um, well, but you, well, you're, gonna go from, you're gonna go from a 13 inch screen, George, I think that MacBook Airs are 13 inch to a 21 or 22 yes. inch screen with a better resolution on that screen, a lot more RAM, which if that doesn't mean anything to you, the memory on a computer tells you how much it can think about right now. So right now your computers have, I think, eight gigabytes of RAM and the new computers have 32. So it's four times as much able to think about right now. Um, bigger, better, faster, nor faster, bigger, better, faster, more. Yes, Ms. Morales, the answer to your question is yes. Um, going back up a couple, Ms. Larison had a follow-up. Uh, she's referring to an assembly bill I'm gonna read the question. Maybe we know it, maybe we don't. Uh, Mr. Harris doesn't know it. Uh, how will the district enact AB 685 in regards to informing employees when a COVID, she put 109, but she means 19. How will the district enact AB 65 in regards to informing employees when a COVID-19 positive case is found? It is a great follow-up and I'm just presuming it's for me. Of course, I'll start, anybody else can jump in and join on. Um, AB 685 has, has several different component parts to it. The, the key um, one is that we're infor we inform employees that may have been exposed. We are already doing that. In addition to contact tracing, um, I have a letter that I send out. It's, it has essentially the same parts to it, but then it is uniquely designed for the specific case that we're talking about informing um, it's provided to the site administrators or the department heads um, in order to be able to then share that with their staff and it gives them um, an overview of what the circumstances have been um, that there's a presumed positive case or an actually someone has tested positive um, for COVID-19 um, and so that's a letter that I designed uh, devised and I have uh, provided it to cabinet for their review and approval and um, but AB 685 will actually become law <clears throat> in in days but January 1st 2021 and it has to do with again informing it has to do with other things but uh, informing people of exposure and if there are any an actual outbreak and an outbreak would be obviously with multiple cases um, that being said, in conjunction with a letter to inform um, to inform people at the impacted department or site, there would also be the need to share it with um, association representatives, right, the leader. So moving forward, adding Miss um, Bishop to it, uh, Miss Inouye, and so on, moving forward as we begin the new year. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Um, we have a couple of, of other questions, but I think they're very specific to individuals. So uh, George and Celia will respond to those directly. Um, 
we're going to give people a little bit of wait time. Or maybe they're all holding their questions, hoping we'll end early and they can get a few minutes back. But in any case, um, thank you for, go ahead, Dr. Palmer. I'm sorry. I just, I wanted to let you know that I, I texted Mr. Ansel and Mr. Gomez, Richard Gomez, to ask about what might be sprayed in the air. And Mr. Uh, Gomez responded to me and indicated, because I believe uh, someone from Steinbeck had asked this question, Ms. Griffith, um, what is sprayed is the super 60 which is the disinfectant um that is that is used throughout all of our buildings to clean it is it is thorough it is complete and it is effective as a disinfective disinfectant um so that is sprayed on surfaces not in the air if it was sprayed in the air that would that i'm going to say should be inadvertent because we um would not be using it to disinfect air but rather surfaces that are common or surfaces that are being used by individuals so maybe it's getting used around the edges of her papers and and that's causing them to curl and yeah. Well, and on Ms. Griffith's behalf, thank you for texting to get an answer in the middle of the live stream. That was thoughtful of you. Um, okay. Seeing no further questions, which is always the thing that makes people, there we go. Uh, nope. Sorry, that the, the spreadsheet just moved. Um, but the, the usually telling people, okay, there's no more questions causes like three more questions to come in. Um, all right, so we're we're up to like 110 viewers, live viewers now. I suppose the rest of the of the teachers will catch this um, recorded. So if anybody has any closing remarks. Josh, um, Josh I'd like to add, um if sure. not everyone wa was watching the board meeting, and I believe that um, Ms. Bishop might have already sent out a message to the membership, but uh, if you were watching or you weren't watching or you know, know the small group cohorts that were supposed to open on January 12th were pushed back to February 1st, and that includes our state preschool. And we will start slowly. So we'll start with small cohorts at reopening first with our um, special day classes and uh, preschools. And then we'll do a phase two when we bring in our, our gen ed students. So maybe towards the end of February. But we will send an updated timeline to the principals and um, Ms. Bishop, and maybe we can get it out to membership. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody left understanding that we're not starting on January 12th. So uh, we'll, we've pushed it back as of now to February 1st. We do have a question that's come in, Josh. We do? Yes, from Ms. Cameron at uh, VRB. It says, does the cleaning oh. agent contain formaldehyde or, or other preservatives? Not to my knowledge. If we're on here a little longer, I'll text and find out. That was a joke. <laughs> I know that it is an approved um, disinfectant, an approved cleaning agent, and it has been um, used for some time. It wouldn't be on any. It, it wouldn't have anything that's on the state list of um, chemicals known to cause breathing uh, breathing problems. But. I know Ms. Mr. Ansel loves email, Ms. Cameron, so you could email him and, you know, then maybe he'll start watching the live stream because I'm telling people to email him. That wasn't very nice. That was not very Christmassy. My apologies. Um, okay. So thank you, Ms. Ansel, for um, reiterating the, the delay in the small group cohort and how that plan's changing based on um, what's happening in our county right now with COVID. And I, I think it probably bears repeating. Um, and George, thanks for spotting that question. I hadn't seen it, I didn't. Okay, um, if, go ahead. Um, if, if we are getting ready to close up, I, I just wanna, um, if I could say generally speaking, and that's to, to everyone in the sound of my voice, whether live or recorded later, um, COVID is scary for all of us. 
Um, but together we really can do our best to protect ourselves. And so I'm hoping that as, as you all teachers um, go forward to a much anticipated and even more well-deserved break that you just practice safe habits and try to include within them some of the things we talked about last week when the counselors and I were, were with you, um, taking care of yourself um, with, with, things that bring you joy and give you comfort and also then bolster you to go back and do the things with courage that you do so well. Um, I just make sure that you do that and make sure that I want to make sure that I am expressing to you that we care about you and we care about your, your safety and your well-being because you're part of our team but because you are part of our family. So bless you all and enjoy the break. Please make sure that you're taking care of yourself. All right, Dr. Palmer, you're up again. <laughs> uh, Ms. Larson from Creekside asks, uh, what will the district policy be for in-person? Uh, six students will each site have a designated sick room? It's a great question. And it, it is one of the things that we were addressing. You remember the spring and um, the end of the year and the, and the COVID task force coming together with high hopes of um, returning on a, on a hybrid model. Um, and when we talked about that, each site was, uh, was tasked with figuring out with members of the task force who did a world tour across all the sites, tasked with figuring out where that, those thermal scanners would be so that when students were coming in at the beginning of their day, we could check their temperatures and make sure that they were within um, the healthy limits. And then if they weren't, where we could safely and discreetly take them to the side and check with an individual um, thermometer and make sure that it was okay to proceed to class or not okay. And then each site had their own unique location, right? so that then we could contact parents. Students could be, um, the student themselves would be discreetly kept and safely kept uh, apart from others. And then parents would be, or caregivers would be called to come and get the students. It's unique to sites. So um, if I know that you work at, um, at Creekside, I heard that mentioned earlier. So Creekside would have their own specific location whereas VRB would have a different specific location, but each site was, um, was tasked with determining those, those locations, probably to be revisited upon our actual return, whether it's February 1st or at another time. Uh, Dr. Ratliff, I think you had something you wanted to, to share. Yes, I just wanted to um, reassure our um, educators about the safety being around children. Preschool has been open now for a couple months and we were with children and we followed all the safety guidelines and did we have exposures? We had a lot of exposures, but they weren't in class. They were outside of class and they may have brought, they may have exposed somebody in class, but the initial exposure came from outside, nobody got it from um, inside the classroom because we've done everything that we were supposed to do. We did close, we closed a couple times because of lack of staffing. So preschool shut down more times <laughs> because we didn't have enough staff. We don't have um, a very large substitute pool in preschool. So when somebody is out, um, sometimes that, relegates us to shutting down. But I want you to know that I know this is scary and I know there's lots of questions, but we are doing it and it can be done safely. You just have to follow the protocols. You can never let your guard down and think just this one time, it's okay. It's never okay this one time. You have to always follow the protocols. And I think that um, we just need to remember that as we go forward, that you just you keep the masks on, the gloves on, and you're going to um, keep your six feet distance. And um, we're going to keep everyone safe. 
So to clarify, I, I think just to, to, to reiterate and clarify, Dr. Ratley, if you're saying that the exposures that happen in preschool happen outside of the classroom, and we know through contact tracing that the transmission wasn't happening student to teacher or teacher to student, and it was the, the student or the, or the adult that was exposed was exposed from outside of the outside of the classroom environment. And then the reason it would shut down is not because the classroom was unsafe, but because preschool has a, a low, basically like a low amount, you, you can lose people before you just don't have enough people in the room to do it correctly. Well, or if I was positive, if I test positive and I came to school because I got it on the weekend with my family, and so I came to school not knowing I was positive, and then I found out, you know, for whatever reason, my, my you know, aunt was positive, then I had to go get tested. Then we had to shut the um, classroom down because now I exposed everyone there. And until everyone got their test back to show they were negative, we had to make sure that n that, that exposure didn't cause, um, you know, somebody else to be um, positive. So were there staff members in a classroom that were positive? Yes, there were at times, but there were no exposure to another staff member because we took all the correct precautions. Staff members were six feet apart. Staff members wore masks. Staff members wore gloves. So if I had already come not knowing I had it, find out I have it, the other staff, we had to quarantine them, right, until we know if they're positive or not. So that's how our classrooms got shut down. Those were the reasons our classrooms got shut down. It wasn't because we were passing the COVID around. It was we were taking all the precautions to make sure we were not passing it to our um, colleagues. Gotcha. All righty. See, I told you, once you say no more questions, more questions come in. But um, I think that was a really good point, Dr. Ratliff, to say, you know, preschool has been doing this and and been vigilant and careful and um, and and doing it right and, and being as successful as it is possible to be with anything in 2020. And there's no guarantees, but. Right. But as my mother is fond of saying, there ain't no guarantees in life. Anybody who tells you different is trying to sell you something. On that, would anybody, would any of the other directors like to have anything they'd like to share? I just want to say again, thank you for everything you've done from the moment we this has started, not even, not just August, but from um, March, our, uh, we're, our students are blessed to have such a hardworking team. And I know that there are times where there's ups and downs and we're not sure what we're doing and we're all at that edge because we are all pulled to the extreme right now that at the end of the day, we do it for the kids. No matter what our thinking and the way we get there, we, we do it for the kids and um, and for the Alisal community. So thank you again. Have a wonderful break. Happy holidays, eat lots of cookies if you're going to bake cookies, if you're going to make tamales, tamales. I don't know how to make ponches for those of you who are familiar with ponches, but I am going to learn um, this this season. So that's one of my tasks. I can make tamales, but now I want some ponches. So um, thank you again for everything you do and have a wonderful break. So speaking of learning, one last, one last, one last reminder. <laughs> about about remember to to submit for the the good teaching conference and i promise you speaking i you know what a great exemplar of of going out and learning something miss anso just admitted she didn't know how to do something and she's going to go learn how to do it i'm sure there will be a lot of youtube and probably some errors because that's what happens when i learn to cook new things um but just I know this has been a difficult year, but take a step back and just look at how many more things you know how to do now. How many of you had never been in a video conference, but now you do it every day? It's like old hat. How many of you have made leaps and bounds in your technological skill 
Um, and yeah, you were supported by a pretty good ed tech department, if I don't say so myself. But, you know, you all have been having to do the work every day and you've been doing the work every day. So kudos to you. And the other thing there is you have probably picked up some things. You have probably learned some things. And I know that especially LSL teachers, but teachers in general tend to be self-effacing and go, oh, if I know this, I'm sure somebody else knows this. No, maybe they don't. Maybe you and, and somebody you work with on your grade level team or maybe your favorite friend put together a, a session. It doesn't have to be super technical or, or fancy. It And just because you've been doing it for a few months now, it might still be a new idea, something that really triggers some creativity or something innovative in another teacher, and then they get to bring it to their kids. And that way you have an impact on more kids and, and for the positive. So, so please submit your sessions for the Good Teaching Conference. Uh, take a step back before the new year and, and honor all the leaps and bounds that you've made in your own uh, learning and ability and skills and how much you've adapted um, in a virtually unthinkable situation. Um, if I told you all this time last year, guess what we're gonna be facing? You wouldn't have believed me. In any case, as we say, at the end of every single one of these, be good to yourselves, be good to each other, be good to our kids, be good to your own kids during the holidays <laughs> and your family members. And I hope that you all stay safe and healthy and we will see you in January. Bye folks.